Hi everyone, my name is Max, welcome to this video, great to have you on board. I already created a couple of videos where I showed what AWS is and how we can use Elastic Beanstalk to host an application, a Laravel application to be precise, this one here. Now in this video I want to take a closer look at what Elastic Beanstalk actually does behind the scenes and what we can configure about our environment, what environments actually are and what we generally can do in this Elastic Beanstalk console. So let's get started. So I'm in the console of my project, of this Laravel project I deployed in this video here. Is that the right side? I hope so. So this video, and this is the running application. It is connected to a database and we already deployed two different versions of that application in that mentioned video. Now, if we start here, on that dashboard of this environment, we're already one level too deep into that application than I wanna be. So let's instead switch to all applications where we see not just the environments, but actually all our applications. And there is a difference. An application in Elastic Beanstalk may contain multiple environments. As you can see on this application, Laravel simple block is the application and we could create more applications. And prod here is the one environment in this application. And we could also create more environments. Environments would be something like a testing environment, a production environment, maybe a new version of your app in a new environment. These would be environment and they run separated from each other, each on their own servers. You can simply create a new environment. And then again, you have to go through that wizard where you set it up and assign a server and so on. You can also use the Elastic Beanstalk CLI, at which I won't have a closer look in this video, to do all that, to create new applications and new environments. With that out of the way, let's go back to this environment. Here we see the dashboard, we see the current status of our application, the recent events that it successfully updated the environment because we shipped new code, which operating system we're actually running, and so on. We can deploy new versions here with the upload and deploy button, we could also use the CLI to automate this. And then we have all these options on the left. Now, before we go to configuration, let's have a look at logs. Here, we can actually retrieve our logs and for that, we have to request them. So we can request the last 100 lines here and logging is set up automatically for us. This, however, now fetches the latest logs. And now we could download them and have a look at them. So if we click this button, we see the latest log files and here we see what happened on our server that we had a 403 error there and well, whatever happened on the server. These are logs and certainly something which might be interesting to you in a real application where you want to, well, detect any anomalies, detect any errors, stuff like that. We'd also got the health section. This shows us the overall health of our application. We can see the kind of requests we got or the responses we sent. And since this application is pretty new, most of that is not populated yet. But here we can monitor what's going on and we can drill down on that and see how many instances we have running, one, and how that is, well, feeling right now. It's okay. As a side note, and I did show this before in another video, you can always switch to the EC2 console. I'm doing this in a new tab. And here under running instances, this instance is the one connected to our Elastic Beanstalk setup, or it's the one managed through Elastic Beanstalk. So this is the one instance we're referring to here. And we can see that here, this is the instance ID. And as you will see, it's obviously the same ID as here. So that is the ID. And here, well, we could, for example, do something with it, like reboot or terminate it if we want it. So this page allows us to track the health of our instances and therefore the health of our application. Under monitoring, we can see how our app behaves in some charts. So the CPU utilization and so on. So this is a lot, it gives you a nice and quick overview over what's going on in your application without looking at the logs and so on. Under alarms, you see any alarms you might've gotten, you can configure them under monitoring here. Here, for example, you could set an alarm on environment health and you could configure when you want to get an alert. For example, if the environment health is below a certain status for one minute or something like that. And you could set up that you get an email when this happens. Also very nice for production applications. 
Managed updates is pretty interesting. You can set it up under configuration, so I will come back to this. Here on this page, you'll then get an overview and managed updates will allow you to opt into managed updates through AWS so that they update critical software on your instance automatically for you, which of course is important from a security perspective. Now under events, we can see which events we had, for example, that we updated the environment and how that went. And under tags, we can assign some tags or CD assign tags to be precise, uh, which will uh, show up in our billing, for example, so that we can track where our costs are coming from. These are all these options. Now let's have a look at configuration. That's probably the most interesting one. Well, here, for example, to go from start to end, we have scaling. If we open this, we see that right now we have a single instance scaling. And that is because we only have one instance. Now, of course, as your application grows, you might want to have more instances here, which distribute the load. You could then switch to load balancing and auto scaling. And there you could then use the built in tools, load balancer and auto scaling. These are services provided by AWS, which will distribute incoming traffic evenly amongst all your instances and which even allow you to spin up new instances to handle certain traffic spikes and remove them once they're not needed anymore. So that's really powerful. I'll go back to single instance, but this is something you definitely want to look into once your application grows and you need more servers. Back to single instance, you can also choose in which availability zone you want to launch new instances. However, I will leave this at the minimum. And for now, we only have that one instance. That leads us to the instances. Here you can see which type of instance we're using. And we could change this to upgrade our application to a, well, more powerful instance, for example. We can also see which security group this instance belongs to. Security groups are basically firewalls, you could say, which allow or which control which traffic may reach our instances and which traffic may leave our instances. Here we can set up an EC2 key pair, which we'll need if we manually want to connect to the instance through SSH, then we will need this key pair to identify ourselves and set up an encrypted access to the, key, uh, to the EC2 instance. The instance profile here, that is one where we can't change anything here. This is required by Elastic Beanstalk to have the right permissions to manage that instance for you. It was created automatically and it basically allows Elastic Beanstalk to spin up instances, terminate them and so on. So what it needs to do behind the scenes for us. How often it should monitor the health of the instances, which AMI it uses, so which image. This defines the operating system and software installed on that instance. And then here we can also set up which kind of volume we want to have. Like here the default, we could attach a SSD and define how much space we want to have. So here we can control the server we're running on. And again, we can upgrade here vertically, choose a stronger instance, or we go back to scaling and switch from single instance to load balancing auto scaling to launch multiple instances. So why don't we do that and click apply? And this will now update our application and as it informs us replace all our current instances so let's click save be aware that switching from one to multiple instances may occur costs especially if you leave it run for a whole month because you only have one month or 750 hours which is one month in hours per month of the t2 micro instances available so if you spin up two of them you're going to pay for one of them if you spin up more powerful ones you're going to pay more so be aware of that still i'm going to show this to you now, this may take a couple of minutes here, actually, since it's switching your complete environment. And in the EC2 management console, you should see that from some point on, it will terminate this instance and spin up a new one. Now it did finish. And if we go get back to configuration, we see that now under scaling, we can configure more. We can configure auto scaling. And here we can set up how many instances, servers we want to have at a minimum and at a maximum and also in which availability zones we want to launch them. This now allows AWS to automatically scale our instances up, add new servers on which our application will run whenever we hit a traffic spike, for example. The scaling trigger is set up here and there it configures upon which condition it will add new servers and how long that condition has to be true. That is a powerful tool since it allows you to really react 
to traffic spikes. It's also a kind of advanced tool, not in the terms of setting it up, that's what, that was easy, but in the terms of getting it right for big applications. And I just want to give you a sneak preview here for your ordinary normal application. The default setup should be absolutely fine. For bigger applications though, if that is how our traffic works over a day, over 24 hours for example, then we could have a default setup of this. We have a constant amount of servers, we have no auto scaling and we have only one server up, but this server is constantly a very relatively strong server. Now the problem with this approach is that we will face server issues during these spikes because the server capacity doesn't suffice. So an alternative might be to set up auto scaling with twice the amount. So now if we have two servers up in each hour here and that is enough capacity for all the spikes, but of course also a lot of wasted or overhead capacity. So we're paying too much. A better solution would be to use auto scaling. And there we bring up additional servers when we need to handle these spikes. Much better already. But still, as you can see, there is a lot of overhead or at least a bit of overhead. So we can do better. So the perfect approach would be to calibrate auto scaling to launch smaller instances, not such powerful ones, but more of these. However, in the long term or overall, it will still be cheaper because the powerful ones are more expensive and we don't require them for most of the time. So this might be a perfect auto scaling setup where we scale up to four of the not so powerful instances and we really calibrate our application to handle these traffic spikes. Now that is quite advanced, but that is how auto scaling works. It adds new servers to handle incoming traffic spikes and it is a lot about really testing that and seeing what is best from a cost and server perspective. That was a little advanced topic. Let's go back to Elastic Beanstalk. Auto scaling is set up. That is what we can take away from that. And not just auto scaling, also load balancing. Because load balancing is the other interesting thing in that equation. We might have more than one instance. We have three. Now all these instances are doing something. So one instance might not be so much under stress another one might be very stressed and might be close to, well, being overloaded. We have an incoming request and this request might, due to our setup, whatever, hit instance free, which can handle it, but which is not the best instance. Instead, we should handle it here. And that is exactly what load balancing will take care of. With load balancing, we have two instances and we have a service called Elastic Load Balancer also added to our Elastic Beanstalk setup here. So both Elastic, but two different services. And this service, Elastic Load Balancer, will route incoming requests to different instances depending on their health, their response time to see how occupied they are. So it may route one request to instance one and a second one to instance two. And we can even combine this with auto scaling to add new servers when needed. Auto scaling will for this also reuse the setup of the existing servers to copy our setup and our application. And Load Balancer will pick these new servers up and also forward requests to them. So that is how both works together. And you don't have to manage anything about that. It's all set up here by Elastic Beanstalk. You can calibrate it a bit here. You can set up your scaling triggers and define how many instances you want to launch and so on. You can still choose which type of instances that would be here under instances. So these instances will be launched by the auto scaling. And that is how these two work together and really make sure that your application works as it should. As you can see, if I visit it, it still works as before, but under the hood, it now has a more complex setup. That was a lot of talking about auto scaling and the instances, but it is important to understand what's happening here and what Elastic Beanstalk can do for you in bigger applications. Auto scaling and distribute incoming traffic amongst all instances you might have running. What about notifications? Here you can get notifications, you can set up an email address where you will be informed about Elastic Beanstalk events, like if the health transitions to degraded or something like that. Under software configuration, we already saw that in another video, you can define things about your server basically, from where your web app is served, which how much memory should be allocated, how you want to output errors, and then some stuff about logging. Also very useful, of course. 
updates and deployments is interesting because here you can configure how updates, so new code, should be shipped to your servers. If you have more than one instance, you can actually choose rolling. If you have only ones, that will not be available. Because what will rolling do? If you have more than one instance, it will ship new code to one instance first and then ship it to the next one. So that you all the time until all instances have been updated, have instances with old code and new code and hence your application is always online because it either is the old code or it already was updated. If you only have one instance, there is of course a short window, a short time window where it will be offline because the code is getting replaced right now. Rolling can prevent this if you have multiple instances. There are some advanced options here and you can always learn more as you can see, but that is basically what you can configure here. Now besides the application deployments, you can also change configuration updates. So whenever you change the configuration of your server and there you can also set this to rolling for example and configure how these changes should be rolled out. Because just like your application code if it changes, if you change the configuration even worse than your application code, there may be a server restart required. So that is something you also want to handle. This is what you can configure here. You again can also Configure auto scaling here, but that could be done under scaling. So that's updates and deployments. Health. Here you can determine or you can set up how Elastic Load Balancer will find out if your application, if your instances are healthy. And you can pass your own URL where it should send a ping. And depending on the ping, how fast this ping responds and if it responds at all, it will determine if your application is healthy. The default should be fine here. But you can configure Elastic Bloat Balancer here a bit more if you are interested in that. Finally, managed updates. That's also interesting. Here you can configure if AWS Elastic Beanstalk should update your server, uh, your, your software on the server. It will not install breaking changes or breaking software changes, but it can install minor and patch updates or just patch if you really just want to get these security patches. So that's a useful feature to make sure that your application is always up to date and that you get the latest security fixes. Now this will update the application. We can still move on to the last thing or to the almost last uh, config item here, the data tier, the database. We did set this up in a different video. Here you can basically change some of the configurations for example, which kind of database you use, you could upgrade here. Other things can't be changed here. You can always use RDS to change things, though then you will also, well, remove it from, from here. So it's preferable that you change it here in the Elastic Beanstalk console to stay in that Elastic Beanstalk world where Elastic Beanstalk manages everything for you. And finally, at the bottom on the network tier, you can set up how your application is served and how it is reachable. This is important for the load balancer here. Here you can configure this elastic load balancer as a bit more, can set up how it determines the instance health and so on. And that is really something where you can dive in deeper if you know how it works. As always, all the default settings should be fine. These are always things you can change, but for a starting application, you don't need to. And as you work more and more with AWS, you will get deeper into it and know what you may change and why. So this was an overview over Elastic Beanstalk, what you can do here, how it works, how you can upgrade from your simple single instance application to a multi-instance auto-scaled load balanced application. I hope this was helpful and you did enjoy it and that with that and the other videos, using AWS and using Beanstalk is a bit clearer. It might look intimidating if you see all these options, but always keep in mind, you can start simple and then add more and more features as you need them.